government orders, business of supply, opposition motion, standing in the name of Mr. Algabra concerning immigration and citizenship. Algabra, seconded by Ms. Rat Ratansi, moves that in the opinion of the House, immigrants to Canada and persons seeking Canadian citizenship are poorly served by this government. Debate the Honourable Member for Mississauga, Arendale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I stand before you today to express the concerns of Canadians about the direction, or more specifically, the lack of direction, that this Conservative government has taken towards helping immigrants and new Canadians reach their optimum potential in society. Canadians are quite rightly proud of our diversity and our reputation for welcoming immigrants. Immigration is more than just a symbol to Canadians, it is also an economic necessity. At the turn of the last century, Sir Wilfrid Laurier's government started settling our vast land with, quote, men in sheepskin uh, coats, end of quote. Immigration levels pe peaked in 1913 when 400,818 immigrants, the equivalent of 1.5 million in today's terms, came to Canada. Today, some 5.4 million Canadians, or 18.6% of the population, are foreign-born, the highest rate of diversity in 70 years. The retirement of baby boomers will have, significant, will have a significant impact on the competitiveness of Canada's economy. In 2001, boomers from ages 37 to 55 comprised 47% of the labor force, and in 10 years, half of them will be 55 or older, and 18% will be over the age of 60. According to, 2000, to the 2001 census, for the first time in history, immigration over the preceding five-year period accounted for more than 50% of Canada's population growth. Over the past decade, immigration has accounted for 70% of Canada's net labor force growth, and Statistics Canada research predicts that between 2011 and 2015, 100% of our net labor force and population growth will come from immigration. The Conference Board of Canada estimates that by 2020, a labor shortage will leave 1 million jobs unfilled. There's global competition for immigrants from growing economic powerhouse, powerhouses like China and India, in addition to the traditional pull of other industrialized nations like the United States and Australia. The benefit of immigration to a country is more than just economic. Immigrants bring diversity, vitality, and innovation to Canada. As American public policy expert Rich, Richard Florida has noted, Diversity is an essential component of a thriving country. In short, over the next 10 years, the country that can best attract and integrate immigrants will have an advantage in the global race. Canada desperately needs to excel at attracting and integrating immigrants as Canadian immigrants are falling further behind. By the year 2000, the gap in earnings between immigrant men and Canadian-born men registered at, a, at an astonishing 40%. The gap was even more pronounced for recent immigrant women as they received 44% lower earnings than their non-immigrant counterpart. In addition, one quarter of recent immigrants were low paid in 2000 compared to one sixth of Canadian born workers. The problem is worsening. A 2005 report by, the R, by RBC Financial Group shows that since the mid 80s, Immigrants have, as a group, experienced declining starting incomes and their salaries are taking longer to catch up to native-born Canadians. Housing ownership rates amongst new Canadians are also in decline. The Conference Board of Canada estimates the loss of income associated with unrecognized skills and credentials to be as high as $6 billion per year, <coughs> half of which is constituted by the lower earnings of foreign-born workers. The toll of underutilization of immigrants can perhaps, be, can perhaps best be seen by our social agencies. In 2005, people not born in Canada made up approximately half of the population 
of 175,000 people using food banks in the Greater Toronto Area, or about 87,500 people. Immigrants using food banks are highly skilled. A remarkable 60% have university level education or trade certification. This is nearly double that of the Canadian-born food bank population, with just 36% who have university level education or a trade certification. Furthermore, within that 60%, 80% of immigrants using food banks have a postgraduate degree. This is approximately eight times the Canadian-born average of just over 1%. There is a gr growing attrition rate among business class and skilled workers, worker immigrants who are increasingly returning to their country of origin or another destination in search of meaning, meaningful employment. More than half of those who leave do so within their first year of arrival. Our reputation as a welcoming country is at stake. A recent online article out of New Delhi warns Quote, for many immigrants, Canada has emerged as a land of unmitigated disaster. From rampant discrimination to hidden booby traps, Indians have been forced into an economic quagmire, having to settle for a dead-end job. End of quote. Immigrant success should be everybody's business, and indeed, it should be a priority for the government. The previous government realized the need for real and serious measures to respond to the growing needs of our immigrants. This was not just rhetoric, it was backed up by action and tangible improvements. <coughs> for the record, <coughs> let me highlight some of the initiatives that we implemented by the previous Liberal government. First, an additional $700 million investment over five years to improve the immigration system. This included funding to reduce the inventory of backlog immigration applications and to allow international students or visitors with Canadian experience to apply for perm permanent resident status. The signing of Canada-Ontario Immigration Agreement, which included an additional $920 million over five years, this was the first comprehensive immigration agreement between Ontario and the federal government and was intended to help newcomers reach their full potential in Ontario by increasing funding for settlement, language training, and integration services. The launching of the $150 million internationally trained worker initiative, this initiative included addressing shortages of healthcare professionals and the startup of the Foreign Credential Recognition Secretariat introduction of measures to speed up the processing of sponsorship application for parents and grandparents, an additional $69 million investment over two years to process citizenship applications faster, a $20 million, a $20 million investment to conduct a review of the existing Citizenship Act, allowing spouses and common-law partners of Canadian citizens and permanent residents regardless of their status to remain in Canada while their immigration application is being considered, allowing international students to work off campus while enrolled at an eligible, eligible post-secondary education. Why did I mention all of that? Mr. Speaker, I wanted to illustrate that when a government identifies certain needs, it must act upon those needs. It derives a plan, it implements actual initiatives, it enacts concrete steps. Contrast that to what this minority conservative government has done. Imprisoned by their ideology, short on ideas, and void of a vision, they canceled some of the previous initiatives and claimed to be a champion of immigration. Using the only method they can think of to solve a problem, the conservatives offered to cut the landing fee by half and claimed that this was a solution to the challenge that many immigrants face. I'll admit, reducing landing fees is a welcome relief to all new immigrants and we support it. But that is a step that offers no strategy and no solution to the short, medium and long-term challenges that immigrants face. 